Hello and welcome to APHA's 15 on COVID-19 series for Friday, May 8th. I'm your host, Dan Zlot, Vice President of Education here at APHA, and today we're going to be talking about shortages of sedation medications that are commonly used for intubated patients. So this is a challenge that uh, many pharmacists, certainly in New York, have had to face, um, but as the COVID-19 crisis continues to expand and different areas experience sort of local hotspots or local surges, uh, this may become an issue for uh, your local hospital. And so uh, we're going to talk today about some proactive, preemptive strategies that you can take maybe to help conserve uh, some of these medications and some other strategies maybe to gain access to these medications. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. As usual, I have nothing to disclose. Here are your learning objectives for today's episode. All right, well, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, sedation meds in COVID-19. So first off, you know, what percentage of patients actually end up requiring mechanical ventilation? So based on the data that we saw in New York, um, just north of 12% of patients who uh, are diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, or at least are hospitalized for COVID-19, I should say, um, may require ventilatory, ventilatory support um, at some point. Now, typically when we talk about that, that's divided into two different categories. There's the non-invasive and invasive mechanical ventilation. Non-invasive mechanical ventilation is going to include modalities like CPAP, BiPAP, um, things like that, whereas invasive mechanical ventilation is going to be you know, typical intubation that we usually think of. Now, um, particularly for the intubated patients, this is not as common for patients who require non-invasive uh, mechanical ventilatory support, but uh, sedation and paralytics are some of the key parts of keeping patients comfortably sedated and actually maximizing the effectiveness of the ventilatory support or, or of mechanical ventilation. Um, because it's uncomfortable, depending on the patient, a lot of patients will fight the vent. They'll try to over-breathe it. Um, they'll breathe out of sync with the vent. And so uh, that can create a lot of challenges. So in order to maximize uh, the efficacy of mechanical ventilation, you know, sedation is a key component of that. Uh, and in some patients, even while they're sedated, uh, they will fight it. And so in some instances, it's necessary to actually induce um, paralysis to allow the mechanical ventilator to do its job. So these two classes of medication uh, really become key components uh, of, again, maximizing the effectiveness of uh, mechanical ventilation. So when you pair that up with some of the um, local spikes that we're seeing in COVID-19 cases, um, again, you know, New York was sort of the um, breeding ground for this in, in the United States, at least so far, where this has certainly been the hardest hitting. Um, but there are other areas that may experience this as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic continues to expand, as there are maybe local surges. Um, what we're seeing is that sometimes there are national, regional, or even relatively local drug shortages. And this can significantly affect the availability of some of the most commonly used sedatives and paralytics. So it's important to have some backup strategies in place, and even more important to think about how we can consider serve some of these resources going in so that maybe we never get into a situation where there's a shortage in the first place. So that's really what we're going to talk about today. So let's go ahead and dive into this a little bit deeper. All right, well, now that we've got a little bit of the background, let's go ahead and jump into some of the main ways that we can conserve uh, some of our sedative medications. And one of the best ways to do that is by not using them in the first place. So the key here is to bring together all the applicable stakeholders uh, to form a multidisciplinary team who can develop strategies and protocols to conserve some of the most commonly used sedatives. So when you're thinking about who needs to be included here, you know, think about all the places in your hospital that routinely use sedatives. So certainly the ICU, uh, the OR anesthesia teams are a, a natural um, group to include. Other groups might be um, you know, groups that use procedural sedation, um, outpatient procedures. So that could be anything from, um, you know, colonoscopies to, you know, relatively minor outpatient procedures that aren't necessarily brought into an OR suite, um, but that are beyond the typical scope of what you might do for, um, you know, with, with a local anesthetic, you know, those types of things. So um, anywhere that that's going on, those are the people who you want to have around the table so that they can have some input, you can get buy-in um, and come up with a plan that, you know, takes into account all the different concerns and works for everybody to ensure critical access um, for COVID-19 patients. Um, 
So as you're probably aware, uh, propofol is one of the mainstays of ICU sedation, particularly for ventilated patients. And so um, that is probably where a lot of the discussion will center. Um, and especially as we start looking at health systems and hospitals reopening for elective procedures, um, it's going to be increasingly important to work closely with these other groups that I mentioned, the, surg the surgery and anesthesia teams, um, these procedural sedation teams, etc., cetera, um, to identify what the best practices are for your particular health system, the types of procedures that your health system or hospital performs uh, to ensure that you have adequate sedation options while at the same time conserving as much as possible. And that may mean making some decisions about what types of procedures are offered and not. Um, so again, you know, you can see there's some things here that are pretty well beyond the scope of pharmacy. So it's really important to include these other groups. Um, one key point is that whenever possible, um, you want to be looking at alternate agents for the induction of anesthesia. So propofol is one of the most commonly used agents for anesthesia induction. Uh, once patients are induced, then they usually switch over to you know, an anesthetic gas to keep patients um, under, depending on what type of procedure and how long uh, the, the case will be. So again, finding some of those alternate agents may help to extend the supply of propofol um, so that it can then be used for COVID-19 patients. So uh, another thing is when you're looking at um, the procedure being performed in particular, these, this tends to apply more to OR cases than procedural cases, but um, even when patients are anesthetized, there are still um, involuntary muscle twitches that can happen. And so you can imagine that, you know, if you're a surgeon and you're working with a scalpel, a bovi, um, any type of a cautery device, etc., the last thing you want when you're trying to perform very fine, uh, very precise procedures uh, is muscle flinches. So uh, there are some instances where paralysis is absolutely critical, and there may be instances where you can get away without um, paralysis. And so, again, that's an important conversation for the OR teams to have in order to uh, potentially preserve paralytics as much as possible in case they're needed either for rapid sequence intubation or for the maintenance of uh, patients who are having difficulty uh, on the ventilator. So uh, a couple points there to consider. All right, well, now let's talk about another approach to conservation. And one of the key things here is the concept of just using the lightest sedation levels possible in order to keep your patients comfortable. So uh, in talking with a couple of groups, they're recommending targeting RAS scores of zero to minus two. Uh, and so, you know, again, that's very much patient specific. So some patients will tolerate a RAS of zero. Others may require a RAS of minus one to keep them comfortable. Others may require a RAS of minus two or even minus three or four, um, depending again on, you know, their, how likely they are to fight the vent. Um, some patients, when they're slightly sedated like that, they'll have a tendency to, you know, pull on their tubes, try to self-extubate, things like that. So again, all of that has to be customized um, per the patient. And so um, the, the key point here is to start off light and go heavier as needed and reserve those deeper levels of sedation for patients who just don't tolerate uh, those lighter RAS targets. Uh, other things to think about are the use of alternate sedatives. So we've mentioned that propofol is the mainstay of ICU sedation, but it's certainly not the only sedative that we have at our disposal. And there, are, there may be instances where either A, because propofol is on shortage, you know, in that case, it doesn't matter what, <laughs> what the preferred is, you have to use what, you, what you've got uh, in order to keep patients sedated. But um, there are some instances where propofol isn't preferred. You know, some propofol, as you know, is uh, a very lipid-rich formulation, and so some patients develop hyperlipidemia uh, while they're receiving propofol. They don't tolerate it, and so uh, other formulations or other drugs are required. And so some of those other medications include dexmedetomidine, fentanyl, um, ketamine, and of course benzodiazepines, or some combination of these as necessary to maintain sedation. So uh, we don't have time to go into a full therapeutic review of all of these uh, in, in our 15-minute episode. However, um, do keep in mind that each of these has different advantages and disadvantages, certain circumstances where one may be preferred over another based on hemodynamic status, et cetera. So, uh, you know, as always, take those things into account when you're selecting which of these agents to, uh, to use in your particular patient. Um, another thing to think about is, you know, what other routes of medication administration are available? So it's not, um, it, it's unusual in typical practice where we have an abundance of IV medications, but um, perhaps um, we may be able to look at other routes, enteral, PO, uh, PR, 
topical maybe even, um, or transdermal, um, that can help to extend our IV products as much as possible uh, for those who truly do need IV formulations. And so when you think about drugs that are available in other formulations, you know, certainly opiates come to mind, benzodiazepines uh, come to mind. And so there's some great opportunities there to maybe get some extended coverage with those particular agents to um, lighten the need for some of the other IV medications. Um, Oral clonidine may be helpful to extend supplies of dexmedetomidine. And so, um, again, it's kind of an unusual approach, but desperate times call for desperate measures sometimes. And this has been uh, found to be fairly effective in um, in our conversations with some people who really have been up against the wall uh, and are facing pretty significant shortages. And so there are people are getting creative uh, with some of the approaches they're taking. Um, do you can always consider transdermal as well. You know, think of like a fentanyl patch, clonidine patch, things like that. Um, I would consider that maybe to be more in the extreme cases. Um, you know, do keep in mind when you're looking at transdermal, I know this goes without saying, but just <laughs> for the point of stating the obvious, you always have to keep in mind that increased time to onset and the time to clearance once the patch is removed. And you have to account for that um, when you're transitioning or considering uh, the transdermal route. So uh, a couple other options again to help extend the supply of sedatives. Um, some other things to think about are some alternate sources um, of, of some of these medications. So in particular, uh, some pharmacies are already set up to do what, what USP would refer to as quote unquote high risk compounding, uh, where you're compounding directly from an active pharmaceutical ingredient in powder form and then uh, filtering as you're compounding in order to turn that into a sterile product suitable for intravenous use. Um, do keep in mind that uh, that's not necessarily uh, something that you want to start in an emergency situation if it's not something your your pharmacy does at baseline. Um, it does require potentially some um, additional considerations of your facility as well as some additional training for your personnel to ensure that they're competent uh, and they understand how to do all of this properly. Um, so again, it's not something you may want to roll out in an emergency situation, but if it's something your hospital is already doing, this may be a fantastic way to extend supplies uh, of commercial, when commercial products run low, if you can actually get the active pharmaceutical ingredient directly, you may be able to you know, compound your own medications and avoid um, a true shortage for your patients. So that's certainly one option for you. Um, of course, the other piece of that is you have to use the appropriate BUD. Uh, again, if your hospital is set up and knows how to do this, you're, you should be familiar with uh, the appropriate BUD for whatever preparations you're making in a high risk setting like that. Some other things to think about are uh, 503B facilities. So these are typically referred to as outsourcing facilities. And so uh, if you happen to already have an existing relationship with a 503B facility, uh, consider leveraging this relationship to obtain needed medications. You know, maybe they, you have a, a relationship with a 503B who typically uh, provides your TPNs uh, at your hospital, but you know that they make, you know, opiates, antibiotics, et cetera, for other hospitals, maybe see if they would be willing to make some opiates for you um, that maybe you could use again to help extend your supplies. So leverage that if you already have an existing relationship. Um, if you don't have an existing relationship, it may be possible to reach out and see if you can form a new relationship. Uh, in shortage situations, a lot of times 503Bs may not be willing to take on new, new customers, but maybe they do, so it never hurts to ask. Um, and you know the worst they tell you is no. Uh, it is important to remember though, however, when you're forming new relationships with 503Bs, it's critical to perform due diligence when you're evaluating outsourced facilities. Um, just because they say they can doesn't mean that they're necessarily doing everything correctly. Um, when, you know, when you get into the 503B territory, that's when you're essentially manufacturing, uh, quote unquote. Uh, so you're, you're creating medications in advance of a, per, of, a, of a prescription for a particular patient. So that's generally considered to be manufacturing by the FDA. And so then you have to comply with uh, current, gamut, current good manufacturing practices, as well as other um, applicable regulations in your state. Uh, each state determines what the applicable regulations in terms of the um, enforceability of USP chapters, et cetera, are to uh, sterile compounding. So uh, do keep that in mind and be sure to do your due diligence um, if you're looking to form new relationships with the 503B facility. Uh, so other things to think about. So now let's talk about some, some potential options for truly severe shortages. You're really up against the wall. Stuff isn't available and you've got sedated patients and you know 
you have to keep them sedated. So um, these are really, just want to emphasize this again, these are last resort kind of options. Uh, and so just a, a clear disclaimer here, APHA takes no responsibility if you decide to use one of these options. You have to carefully evaluate the potential risks and benefits to determine if uh, a given approach is appropriate for your patients in your particular circumstances. Again, only you know you're going to be there on the front line seeing what is available, what's not available, etc. So huge disclaimer there. And again, just to reemphasize, you have to use your clinical judgment um, to really determine if any of these approaches are necessary and appropriate. Um, so in the event of truly severe shortages, uh, start digging through the history books and take a look at what was used for anesthesia um, prior to some of the more modern anesthetics that are out there, the anesthetic gases, et cetera. And Spoiler alert, here's, here's typically what you'll find is that um, probably the, the most recent historical uh, anesthetic would be barbiturates. Uh, so those were used for quite a while. And in fact, uh, methohexetol, for example, is a barbiturate that's still used for uh, induction of anesthesia. So um, there are some potential options there. Uh, and again, the, one of the potential advantages of barbiturates is that they're available both as uh, intravenous as well as um, oral formulation, so that you may, again, help extend your uh, IV supply there. Uh, of course, barbiturates have some drawbacks. So again, like everything else, it's not a, a panacea. You really have to assess and make sure that those are appropriate for your patients. Um, one other conversation that came up a couple times was anesthetic gases. Would it be a basically possible to anesthetize your patients, keep them on anesthesia um, in order to keep them sedated. And one of the things that came up over and over again as we had these discussions were, you know, some concerns about long-term use. You know, typically um, anesthetics are not used for extended periods of time. You know, some of the longer surgeries you might read about 18 or 24 hours, but that's about the extent of anesthesia. So when you're talking about keeping someone anesthetized for weeks at a time, um, that's unchartered territory. Um, other concerns are with airflow. So keep in mind with anesthetic gases, um, the machine that you see in the photo there is actually an anesthesia machine, and they're designed to actually recapture um, the uh, gases that come out of the patient's lungs, scrub out the CO2, and then recycle the anesthetic gases. And so they do a pretty good job of that. But even with that, no system is 100%. So potentially you may have you know slight leaks of uh, anesthetic gases into whatever space you're keeping your patients in. So you have to make sure that you have adequate air uh, air supply, air exhaust. Um, and so um, you really have to think long and hard about that. This And this is really, really extreme types of stuff we're talking about. So before you think about doing this, it's really important to consult with your anesthesia teams, obviously, because um, they're going to have to monitor all this and administer everything. But also probably your facilities or engineering crew, depending on what you call whoever manages those types of things at your facility um, prior to even attempting this. Uh, you know, it would be terrible if you actually started to get therapeutic levels of anesthetic gases floating around in an ICU. You can only imagine what that would look like. So uh, again, I mean, we were really talking about severe things. So this is truly last resort kind of stuff. So um, that, I think, will kind of cover the, the main points to discuss. Um, for today, I did want to give a very special thank you uh, to some of the people that we were able to speak with just to help bounce some of these ideas off of each other. Uh, and they are, they're, you know, the folks who are out there actually planning all of this. So a huge thank you to the Cleveland Clinic Critical Care Pharmacy team. Um, they really provided some incredibly helpful and invaluable um, thoughts and insights as we were talking about this and as we were going back and forth. So um, Stephanie, Gretchen, Amanda, and Matt, um, big, big thank you to you. Uh, we're so appreciative of your insights and just kind of sharing with us your thought processes and some of the strategies that um, you're using to help prepare. So that will wrap up um, today's 15 on COVID-19 episode. Uh, coming up on Monday, one of the next questions we've been getting a lot is about anticoagulation and COVID-19. So there's been a lot of interest in this. So um, we will take a look at it, see what the literature has to say, see if there are any recommendations out there. So until then, we hope you have a wonderful weekend and we hope to see you on Monday. And as always, if you have questions, keep them coming. There seems to be no shortage of uh, new information coming out about COVID-19. So um, please email us your questions that you'd like to have answered, covided at aphanet.org. Thank you so much again for joining us, and we will talk to you on Monday.